Genesis chapter 3, and then uh, we'll read verse 19. Genesis chapter 3, we'll read verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Uh, in this passage in Genesis, the Lord gave the curse to mankind. Their curse is that they are supposed to work hard. They are supposed to sweat. They are supposed to labor, go through struggle, immense struggle, to be able to survive. That was the curse that mankind received, and one of it is breaking a sweat. You have to break a sweat in order to get by in life. Nowadays, we live in a day and age where people do not want to break out any sweat. That's why they built air condition. That's the reason why people try to find ways to go around hard work, hard living. But in, the, in this culture that we lived in, we are eating the fruits of our sin. The sin of these people where they be, become too relaxed, this area is very, very relaxed. This area has become uh, very, very sinful. This area has become uh, a way where they have not been accountable, responsible, or hardworking. Uh, when I went to uh, Korea, I was very surprised on how fast these people were in their work. Usually I would tell my wife when we would go through a line or a uh, cashier's wrapping up gifts or something like that, I would tell her, honey, you got to be patient. You know, you got to learn to wait on the Lord. Then when I went to Korea, I was like, oh my goodness, these people work fast and they get the job quickly. And I was like, you know, you're right, San Francisco is lazy. <laughs> But there is no doubt that in our culture, we become two feeling good people, very sensitive. We don't like suffering. We don't like to struggle. We don't like to work hard. I want to preach against that sin. It is very important that as Bible-believing Christians, we are not uh, people living under a prosperity gospel, thinking that everything is fine and dandy. We are soldiers in a war. And we've forgotten that. As soldiers, we put down our helmets, our shields, and our swords and settle down with the world. And we forgot what working, what suffering, what labor is. It's important that we can never forget that. Did you forget what uh, happened three years ago, what we went through? We should never forget what we went through. It was very important that we went through that. We cannot settle down with the world. Never, ever should we put down our swords and our armor. But nowadays, uh, we get so sucked up into this American culture that all we're thinking about is settling down. When you settle down, this is the fruits of what you're eating today. Yeah. You wonder why the economy is falling apart. You, know, you wonder why the government is not solving things. You wonder why everything is falling to pieces. That's us eating the fruit of our sin because we're not willing to struggle we're not willing to put out a sweat. I hope that as Christians, we don't forget that. Uh, we, got to, we, we can't forget what it's like to fight in a war. We can never forget that. The title of my message is Break a Sweat. Let's pray. Father, will you fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit? Um, Father, I am not in my best shape, but Lord, uh, the power is not in the tone of my voice, but through you. I pray they will sense the Holy Spirit. Lives will be changed. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to keep examining Genesis 3.19. So keep your hand there. The Bible says in the sweat. In the sweat. Notice that you have to be in the sweat in order to uh, make any living, in order to survive. The verse never said against the sweat. It said, in the sweat. But nowadays, we live in a day and age where people are working against the sweat. If there is a shortcut for you to get around the problem or the pain, would you take it? Of course, you and I would take it. But a lot of times, see, that's the devil's trick, is that he shows you a shortcut around the pain, which is why we give in to temptation quite often which is why we try to dodge the trial that God wants to hone and use us for. The problem with us nowadays is that we do not want to work in the sweat, in the sweat. We want to work against the sweat, around the sweat, above the sweat. My friend, 
I don't know if you have a King James Bible, but the last time I looked, it said in the sweat. It never said around, it never said above, it never says against, it says in the sweat. And that's good for you. You have to realize that breaking out a sweat is good for you. You know, didn't you know that even though we would view this as, well, this is a negative thing, this is a bad thing, I don't want to break out a sweat. But believe it or not, this so-called bad thing that you and I would view it as is actually a very good thing. Amen. Scientists even say that. They say that sweat is important for our body. Amen. The reason why is because if our body temperature heats up and the muscles heats up, the internal temperature heats up, it needs the sweat to refresh it, Amen. to cool it down. You have to understand that things that we view in life that we deem to be negative, that we don't like, that we want to avoid, could be those things that can refresh you, that can actually help you. In our minds, we don't see it that way. How can this trial work out for my good? How can this trial be good for me? How can this trial be a benefit to me? If you go against the sweat, if you go against the trial, that is worse for you. That's what everyone's doing right now, working against the sweat. And because of that, they're eating the fruit of their sin. See, you have to realize this. You have to go in the sweat. If you go around it, if you try to run away from it, if you work against it, then you are headed for a world of trouble. Every historical time period you studied, people have warred and conquered to create a successful civilization. But those people who lived, the next generations who lived in a very successful civilization, forgot what war was like from their ancestors. And they became too comfortable. They became effeminate. They became too settled down. And that's why they became open prey for the next uh, nations to eat them, gobble them up, and to conquer them. Look up nearly every civilization and nation you study. Usually the beginning generations who know work conquer, warring, yeah. turn to be a successful civilization. But the, the next generations who lived in a successful civilization, who don't know war, who don't know sweat, who don't know trial, who don't know suffering, they're the ones who become open prey and they fall apart to their enemies. You have to realize this is that you got a wicked enemy out there. You got the world, the flesh, the devil. You ever wondered why you keep repeating your sinful cycle? You ever wonder why these three enemies keep eating you up? It's because you worked against the sweat. You avoided warfare. You avoided struggle. You avoided suffering. It's so important you've got to learn suffering. You've got to receive suffering. You got to be used to enduring so much suffering. You have to do that. That way you can survive. You can thrive. People who survive and thrive are not those who are settled down and comfortable. Right. These are the people who don't know how to fight, who don't know how to overcome problems. And when problems come, they become dependent on something or somebody else to take care of the problem for them. Do you see that in this country nowadays? See, they become very dependent now. They want somebody to take care of the problems for them. And it's going to become more centralized, centralized until you want an antichrist. Right. You want a messiah or a savior to solve all these world's problems. See, that's what we're heading towards. So you have to realize that uh, it, suffering is very important that you must go through in order to survive. Why? Because it's good for you. Go to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1. Didn't you know that suffering is precious? Precious than having a billion dollars in your accounts and you living prosperously? A lot of you don't believe that, but God differs. God believes that suffering or the trials you go through, that sweat you're breaking out is far more valuable and precious than becoming a billionaire. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. The Bible says that the trial, see that? trial of your faith being much more what than of what gold. gold that perisheth isn't that amazing wow. the bible says your suffering your trial is far more valuable 
than gold. Why? Because trial builds you up, makes you successful. Gold fades away. People think as long as I have the comforts, as long as I have my plan set up, the standards, and everything uh, settled down, and then I'm dependent on something to take care of me, as long as I have all these lined up, I'll be fine. Those things fade away and die out. But suffering, what it does, it builds you up. It makes you learn how to become successful. Trial is much more valuable than gold. That verse says, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. See, that sweat, that trial refreshes you. That sweat, that trial blesses you. It helps you. Are you in the sweat? How often are you in the sweat? Or are you working against the sweat? Are you going around the sweat? You know, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, if you're in this Bible-believing church, you're already in the sweat. Amen. Now you have to ask yourself, am I going around it? Am I going against it? Am I trying to go above it? You have to look at yourself and see, how many times have I tried to work against the sweat? Or am I in it? In it. In that fire. In that pain. In that suffering. Nobody likes it. But if you get out of it, then you're going to die. You're not going to survive. You become open prey to the enemy. Are you in the sweat right now? Are you in the sweat? The next part of verse 19 says, Of thy face. Of thy face. Uh, interestingly, the Holy Spirit, the author says, The sweat of your face you're going to eat your bread. You're going to eat your food. Um, why do you have to add of thy face, you know? I mean, sweat, if there's a place you're going to think about breaking out of sweat, it'll be your armpits for crying out loud. Don't you think so? I mean, that's why, everyone, that's why people use underarm deodorant. So then, why, in the sweat of thy armpits, why don't you do it that way, Lord? So if you're going to think about sweat, why do you have to put the face you know, why not the feet? Why not uh, your back? I mean, when you go outside in the sun, your back gets drenched, you know? So then, oh, in the sweat of thy back, why is it the face? The face. You know, uh, what is the most important part in your body? It's not the foot. It's not the leg. It's not the hand. A lot of times in the Bible, the most important feature in your body is the face. The face is probably the most important thing in your body. The Bible says, in the sweat of your most important side, in the sweat of your most important part, you're going to have to eat bread. You're going to have to survive. You know, we can break out of sweat for the Lord. You might be a hard worker coming to church, reading the Bible. You're going through a health problem, yet you're enduring that and you're rejoicing in the Lord financial problem, but you learn to have faith in the Lord. But I'm not talking about those things. I'm not talking about those sufferings, those trials. Anybody could do those things for the Lord. They can break out of sweat. They can go through trials for the Lord. But what about your most important part? What about breaking out of sweat in your most important part? You know what the devil always goes for? Not your strong side. He always goes for the most valuable, the most vulnerable, the most important side to you. If there's one thing you know about demonic attacks is that it always aims for that area that hits you hard the most at the center of your heart. And that's where the enemy always drives. This most important part, you're not used to suffering. This most important part, you're not used to getting hurt. This most important part, you're not used to enduring. If you've never done that, bet, you, bet your life the devil's going to aim that part. When we break out a sweat for the Lord, it's got to be our most important side. If you don't learn to suffer at your most important, valuable part, then you will die. The devil will get you hard. The devil always aims for that part. 
it's too valuable, but you know, it wouldn't be a sacrifice if you didn't give up what is most valuable to you. And if there's one thing you know about the Lord, the Lord, he doesn't want Abraham's riches. He doesn't want Abraham's tents. He doesn't want Abraham's property. He wanted Abraham's Isaac. If there's one thing that you know about the Lord, he wants the thing that's most valuable to you. And if you're not willing to give that up to him, then you will die. You won't survive. Because you betcha the devil's going to aim that part. You know why a lot of people ended up in the world? You know why a lot of people ended up to the temptations of their flesh? The things that they desire to do that is outside of the will of God. You know why people have always ended up in there? The devil always appealed to their most important, valuable desire. As long as he feeds them that, then he will control them. You ever wondered why uh, the next generations always mess up in sin? The devil always tries to fulfill their most important desirable parts. And if you're not careful, then you can kill yourself, you can get ruined, and the devil will have you. You have to guard your most important parts. What is most important to you? It's time to think about that. Some of you don't even know what's most important to you. And if you're not careful, then the devil knows and the Lord knows except you. And by the time you go through 10 years of trial, then you'll open your eyes and realize, oh my goodness, this was what was most important to me. You don't want that in your life. It's best to see now. What is your Isaac that must be sacrificed? What is your most important part? You have to look at that. A lot of times it may not be your property, it may not be your possessions, it could even be just your ego. I know that's the number one thing a lot of times the devil aims for, that the Lord wants, is you. He always aims for your ego. That's why a lot of divisions happen. Bitterness happens. A lot of depression happens. A lot of uh, humiliating situations you don't want to go through, but the Lord puts you through. Yeah. is because of that ego that you want to protect. If you're not careful, then the devil will hit you right there. Yes, Sometimes the most important parts you have to see, you have to check out. The Bible says right here, shalt thou eat bread, in verse 19. Shalt thou eat bread. You know, for Adam... I know that he's hearing all these curses, right? And he's probably not happy. In the sweat of thy face, you're going to eat bread. You're going to have to work at the ground. So you can imagine what's going on in Adam's mind. Oh, imagine after you sinned and you're in front of God and God spells out all these curses and you're like, oh my goodness, I never heard of some of this stuff before. Man, this is awful. I don't want to go through that. But you know, at, at least it's not all bad news. At least it's all not bad news. You know, Adam's sin is what cursed the ground, right? Well, if his sin cursed the ground, then he should have no food, actually. If Adam's sin cursed the ground, then he shouldn't have anything from the ground. At least he gets something. You know, the verse says at 18, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. That sounds negative, thorns, sisals coming out of the ground. But hey, instead of looking at thorns and sisals, the curse, and then the ground where he can't just pick up the food easily anymore, and sin, how it corrupted the ground, I mean, look at that. At least he can eat the herb of the field. At least that he can eat bread. As a matter of fact, not just uh, eat bread, but shall eat bread, meaning that it's a guarantee he must eat bread that way. See, the good news is this, is that even though uh, Adam has to work out quite a sweat, that doesn't mean it has to end there. When he works out a sweat, he can expect, expect a reward after that. You know what the problem with all of us when we are in the sweat? When we are in the pain, in the trial, we never think about the reward that comes. We think that once we're in the sweat, that's all there is to it. And that I have to go to the next sweat, the next pain, and the next depression, the next endurance. Oh, how horrible in life. How horrible my life is. My friend, it's not all doom and gloom. You forgot 
the reward that comes out of the sweat. The Bible says, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Do you understand what that means? That verse is not a sorrowful verse. That verse says that tears that you, get, that you go through is something you sow. So in other words, you're working to gain something. When you sow, you're supposed to reap something. You know what that verse says? You reap joy. So when you're in the sweat, don't think that you're just in it. You're working to gain something. Why is it that we as Bible-believing Christians can't think about when we go through trials or tribulations or hardships in life that something good is about to happen? Why can't we ever think like that? We have to realize that something good is about to happen. Haven't we seen nearly all the time in this church that whenever something bad happens, something good, something good came out of it? All the time. Haven't you seen in your Christian walk when you went through pain, when you went through trial, in the sweat, that the Lord got something good out of it. You have to eat fruit. You have to eat the success. You have to eat the reward. And that's important to think about when you break out a sweat. You know why people don't want to work out a sweat? Because they're not thinking about the reward. They think that when they're breaking out a sweat, that's all there is to it. My friend, you have to think about the reward that comes out of it. My friend, if we, you and I really died and went to heaven and saw what was really up there, you and I would work like crazy and, and we wouldn't care what kind of trial or pain we would go through. But quite often we try to work against it, around the sweat, the pain, don't we? My friend, if you really know what's up there, if you really believe what's up there, if you really see what's up there, then you'd work up any sweat to get it. Don't think about the sweat. Do you think about the reward? Do you think about the blessing? Do you think about the good that God can give to you out of it? Then work up a sweat. Work up a sweat. You know what people try to do? People try to go around the sweat to get a reward. All the time. This is our day and age, our culture. But my friend, that's not how it works. Every, everything has a price to pay. You have to realize that. That's called the law of sowing and reaping, and it's a law. Every, that's how even science works, all right? Even this day and age of how science works, it can't just come from nothing like that. The laws of thermodynamics and everything demands that uh, anything that you want to gain out of it, there must be something there to contribute. There must be something there to pay for it. To really just grab any reward without any payment, expect a huge debt to pay off later on and a huge penalty that will weigh over your head. But that's how we Americans are so deceived into thinking. We think that we can just live up and enjoy the American life without any suffering, without any cost, without any high price to pay. This church don't come here without a cost, without a high price to pay. How we were able to enjoy our blowout, how we were able to enjoy our fruits, it don't come without cost. And if you think by joining this church you can just keep gleaning fruits without paying something for it, then you're in a world of deception. You want to keep gleaning fruits here? I don't know about you. I want to keep gleaning fruits here, don't you? Don't you want to enjoy the blessings of God? I don't know about you, but I want to. Then where's your sweat? Where's your sacrifice? Where's your labor? Expect that if you want a fruit. Next part says, till thou return unto the ground. Till thou return unto the ground. Now, Adam's hearing this for the first time. Can you imagine? All right, Adam, the ground is cursed, and you're going to have to work to eat food, and then you're going to go back to the ground. And Adam's like, what? I'm not going to live forever. No, you're going to die. What is dying? Well, your life's going to end. I don't know what that's like, Lord. That's scary. God's like, yeah, but that's the curse of sin. You're going to die. You're going to go back to the ground. Well, Lord, uh, can I just be transported someplace else? No. Lord, can't you put me at a different place? No. 
Well, where else can you put me, God? Do you want to go to hell? Uh, no, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. You have to realize this is that God has no choice but to put Adam back in the dirt because he sinned. His sin corrupted the earth. Now, either he can jump down into hell, which obviously Adam and the Lord don't want, but there's no other place for him to go. So God's like, well, you were created from the ground. If you sinned in your body and you're created from the ground, it wouldn't make sense to just go back to the ground. There's no other place that I can put you, boy. So Adam realized that till the day he died, that uh, till the day he died, he's going to have to sweat it out, sweat it out, sweat it out until he returns back to the ground. In the end, every sweat and every labor goes back to the ground. You know that? Every effort of mankind, all the sacrifices, all the geniuses you can think of from past history, all the world's conquerors from past history, everybody who worked up a sweat and labor, in the end, they all go back to the ground. They all return to the ground. You will always return to the ground. And that's important to understand as we work out a sweat, we've got to return to the ground. That's inevitable. It is inevitable in life. But a lot of times we try to avoid the inevitable. We don't want to return to the ground. But it is important that as Bible-believing Christians, we go back to the ground. Go to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. You know what the ground represents? It is the basics. It is the basics of where Adam came from, the ground. So God says, you're going to go back to the basic elements. That's where you're going to return to. In the Christian walk, it is very important that when we work out a sweat, that we have to return to our basic elements. It's very important to do that. We got to return. We got to go back to the basics. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and what? Grounded in love. In the Bible, when we look up that word grounded, it has so many times in reference to, the, to our basic beginning. That is our foundation. That is where we come from. Same thing like Adam. That is where he come from. That is the basic elements. And God says that he has to go back to there. Oh, look at Colossians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, Colossians chapter 1. And then uh, we'll look at verse 23. Notice that the word of God says, if he continue in the faith. See, the, ver the very basic of where we come from, in the faith. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. You know, the Bible also says that Timothy, the pillar and ground of the truth. Uh, the problem with uh, fast-moving city life, consumerism Americans who wants to take shortcuts and work against the sweat, is that they refuse to go back to the basics. They always want to go around, jump ahead of the curve. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You know, the problem with us in our Christian walk is we want to serve God. We want to do our best for him. But as you're spiritually growing in the Lord, God wants you to go back to those basics. We don't want to go back to the basics. We think that we're already grown up, that we've spiritually passed through him and that we can go to the next phase. My friend... You got to go back to the basics. Well, I don't want to go back to the basics, Pastor. See, that's your problem. You don't want to break a sweat. You know what Genesis 3 said? When you break a sweat, you return to the ground. If you're going to break a sweat, you need to return to the basics, the foundation, the ground. Nobody wants to do that. Who wants to go back to the basics? No, uh, you've got to. I, th I thought that I knew everything after PBI, and then, then after that, the Lord says, uh, you know, you're getting to a room with less than 10 people. 
and then you're going to teach them basic discipleship. Lord, I want to teach revelation. Lord, I want to teach some deep doctrines. No, to the basics. To the basics. Back to the basics, child. Step by step. God, I want to jump ahead. It's about time that I... Grew. No, go back. Return to the ground. Return to the basics. Even in our very deep teachings, we have to ask ourselves, do we return to the basics? When you return to the basics, the deep teachings become more profound. In your practical living, how you live your life with your family and your workplace, do you return to the basics? It helps with relationships in the workplace and in the family. You always have to go back to the basics. In your walk with Jesus Christ, do you go back to the basics? A lot of times we go by ritual, right? We go by ritual, by routine. But we don't go back to the basics. That was the church of Ephesus' problem, is that Jesus Christ said, you've left your first love. We're too caught up with so many souls getting saved. We're too caught up with uh, numbers filling up the pews. We're too caught up with having big revival meetings. We're too caught up with, you know, deeper teachings. We're too caught up with this next thing, the next thing, the next plan in our church. Uh, but we forgot our basics, our roots, where we come from. We forget that. You got to go back. You got to go back to the ground. When is the last time? you return to the ground. When is the last time you ever retraced your steps to the basics? A lot of problems, I realize, church problems, personal problems, mental problems, family problems, spiritual problems are mostly resolved when we go back, when we retrace our steps. But a lot of times we don't want to go back there. Maybe it's called trauma. Maybe it's called arrogance. Maybe it's called, no, I don't think there's something back there. But you have to return to the ground. And that's where it all begins. If you started out wrong at the beginning, and then you're jumping ahead, you know what you are? You are what the Bible says about a foolish man who built the best house ever. It could be a mansion. It could be uh, three stories tall, best of marble shape and beautiful home but its ground was sinking sand, and that house crumbled and fell. The ground is the most important. Your foundation is the most important. You got to look at your family, your home life, and you got to look at your ground, not at everything you built. That's our problem. We looked at everything what we built. No, no, you got to look at your ground. Did you start it out right? Are you grounded in something right? This church don't come out like this. It has to be grounded in something right first. The sins that you're struggling with, you have to look at your ground, your beginning. You started out wrong, perhaps. That's why you're repeating a cycle. Your relationship with the Lord, are you truly satisfied? Can you truly say that it's a good spiritual relationship with God? If not, why? If not, why? Go back to your ground. Nobody likes to go back to the ground. But see, that's the problem. You don't want to work out a sweat. You don't want to work out a sweat. Continuing on, the Bible says, For out of it, in verse 19, For out of it was thou taken. Isn't it amazing that out of this cursed ground, that's where Adam was taken and created and made, One of the most fascinating creations that you can ever think about. The epitome of evolution and science that all scientists uh, rave about and think that mankind is so great and such a god. This kind of being, man, human, that God created was from a cursed ground. Can you believe that? It was from a ground that God cursed. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Dust, man. Isn't that amazing? From a piece of dirt, God created one of the most fascinating creations. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground 
the ground that he cursed and breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Isn't it amazing that God can create something so wonderful from a ground like that? You know, um, nobody likes a cursed ground. Nobody likes that. But we fail to realize that out of some cursed things in our life, something beautiful can come out. A beautiful creation, an apex can come out of it. Who would have thought that in cursed San Francisco Bay Area, you can get something beautiful? Thought about that? How many Bible believers or preachers who came here found it hard to believe that some, something spiritual feel, filling and beautiful or a blowout or something great as a church like this can come out from a cursed ground like this? But how do you do that from the cursed ground? It's sweat. Sweat. Lots of sweat. Lots of pain, lots of trial, yes. and you can get something beautiful out of it. Yes. When, when we go through a cursed ground in our lives, we don't want it. That's why we want to migrate to Florida. <laughs> uh, yeah. But believe me, Florida's cursed time is coming. Yes. Yes. And fi you'll find out that there's no other place to migrate to, okay? Right. You'll be some... Uh, island in the middle of Fiji or something like that, and that will go down too. Yeah. Nothing in this world is safe. That's right. Everything will be cursed. Everything cursed. Everyone's just going by borrowed time, That's right. trying to enjoy leftover goods or benefits that this world has to offer. But time is running out, yeah. and we've seen that three years ago. Yeah. Nothing lasts forever. Right. But what lasts, what gives the benefit, is that trial, that pain, that sweat. And it gives an, a substance that can last, a benefit that can last. But eating up leftover blessings, leftover goods and benefits, runs out. The sands of time are sinking. And you better enjoy a while last. If you're in the world, if you're taking shortcuts in your life, if you're trying to live the comforts of America, I want to encourage you, enjoy it while you can. Because your time is running out. And you know it. Good and that's you. why you have a forever worry and fear about your future. Yeah. But us saved Christians, when we go through pain and trial, yeah. we have a peace that passes beyond understanding. Because we know that our God will provide our needs. He will take yeah. care of us. He will produce something good out of this. Yeah. So then, make your choice. Yeah. Take your pick. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Do you think that I wanted this cursed ground to pastor? No, I never wanted this cursed ground. This is probably one of the biggest cursed places in America. Who'd want this place? But I believed in my God. I believed the trial he gave me was more precious than the goal that perisheth. And he gave me something more valuable. That's why I'm here in this uh, pulpit preaching to you right now. Why? I really miss this church. I really missed you guys. I really miss preaching at you. This is so precious. Why would the Lord transform my heart? Strange what the Lord can do. But see, it's from a cursed ground. You can get something precious. Is that how it works? The book of John says that, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, but afterwards it bringeth forth much fruit. See, something cursed, something bad. No one wants to take, but if you won't take it, my friend, you're going to miss out something beautiful in your life. Like I told you, try to avoid every cursed ground in your life. This whole world's cursed, all right? You're not going to run away from it. The best thing to do is take that cursed ground and toil and labor and put up a sweat and an effort and fight for that piece of dirt and fight for it and fight for it and fight for it until something beautiful can come out of it. If you, if you die fighting for that piece of dirt, you die fighting for it. Because the Bible says, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but afterward bringeth forth much fruit. Amen. Nobody wants that cursed ground, but you better work for that cursed ground because it can become something beautiful. 
Uh, you know, it's interesting, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus talked about the parable of the sower, sowing seeds, right? When he sowed that seed into good ground, it produced much fruit, correct? Uh, isn't it strange that in the parable, Jesus called it good ground when it's supposed to be cursed ground? Oh, wow. I mean, God says the ground is cursed. But that part of the ground is considered to be good. Amen. And it brought forth much fruit. Can I tell you something even more daring? I would even dare say that in that parable, we've heard about the seed cast on the wayside where the birds ate it up. The seeds that were cast down stony places and then they sprouted up, but they died by the sun. The ground where there were thorns choking it and then the, the fruit died out because of it. I would even dare say that in these three cursed grounds, if you worked hard and removed those curses, you could have gotten good fruit. You know, I don't know what ground, what cursed ground you're in. Is it the wayside where the fowls of the air, those devils are just trying to eat up your seeds? Then what do you do? You just drive them out. Drive those birds away. Kill those stinking devils, man. Plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Protect your seeds. Don't let the fowls of the air eat it up. But you let those fowls of the air, those devils, eat up your life, your home, your thoughts, and you let them eat up that fruit in your life. Oh, you know, I'm just a hopeless case. No, you're not a cursed, hopeless case. You can save your cursed ground. Amen. Now just drive those fowls away, protect those seeds, and let it bring forth fruit. Are you the cursed ground that's on stony places where the Bible says that when trials and tribulations happen, they can't endure and then they get scorched out by the sun? Why then uh, remove those stones then in your life? Right. Remove those rocks in your life. Right. Remove those stones and those rocks in your lives and then endure the trial, endure the pain. Be that ground that wants to endure, that, wants, that is willing to go through suffering. And then that way the sun don't scorch you and that plant can grow up and survive. Endure those trials and tribulations. You can save your cursed ground. Are you the cursed ground with thorns, worldliness in your life that chokes up your fruit and you can't produce any blessing, any fruit for the Lord? Well, then chop down those thorns. Burn those thorns. I've had some people who just trashed or burned their sinful worldly materials. Because they didn't want those things to choke up their life. You feeling choked by the world? I'll tell you one, one good advice, all right? Burn those worldly things, all right? We do, we do much good if we all end up Amish, maybe, you know? <laughs> Don't let worldly work consume us, worldly school consume us, worldly possessions consume Amen. us, worldly TV, worldly internet, we, worldly clothes. We just got too much of the world in us that it's choking up our life that we can't enjoy the blessings of God. Good preaching. I think it's about time that you went back home and then burned up those thorns, those worldly thorns. You can save your cursed ground. It's never too late. Save your cursed ground. Let it bring forth good fruit. For out of it was thou taken. All right. Uh, if we look back at our main text, the last part, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. That's a negative reference to Adam, where he is dust. And he's going to have to return to dust. Our bodies, uh, it's fascinating, the creation of our bodies, but a huge percent of it, percentage of it matches with dust, believe it or not, our bodies. Because that's what we are. That's where we come from. If that's what we are, do you know what you're capable of? Do you realize what you're capable of? A lot of us don't see this. Well, if we look at Genesis 3, 14, Genesis 3, 14, what does the serpent do? And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and what? Dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Didn't you know you're 
capable of e being eaten by the devil. That serpent eats dust, and we are the dust. Didn't you know the Bible says in 1 Peter, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may what? Devour. That means eats you up. You know, uh, the problem uh, with our flesh, and we don't realize, you think you're invincible. You think that uh, nothing's going to hurt your life. You think that uh, nothing out there can kill you. But you got to realize that this flesh is so weak, it is capable of being eaten by the devil. Yeah. Being eaten by the devil. Being choked by the devil. Being devoured by the devil. Some of you are so blind that you're not seeing it. Come on. You are prone to that. How can you live your life working without a sweat, working without fighting, and think that the devil ain't going to eat you up? You know, the, uh, in order for the devil not to eat us up, how do we fight against the devil? Well, Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God, right? Yes. So we have to arm ourselves with God's armor so that the devil don't eat us up, don't attack us. It's true that we have to have the armor of God and that is the secret weapons that can help us fight against the devil. But didn't you know that before you can even do the armor, you have to do something? Go to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. A lot of us think, well, as long as I read the Bible, as long as I pray, as long as I uh, have the breastplate of righteousness, go out soul winning, all these armor of God, then I'll be fine. The devil won't eat me up. That is partially true, but there's something more to it that's missing. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Notice what the Bible says right here. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. So you have to take the whole armor of God so that you can be protected from the devil. But notice right here, and having done all. So you've done everything in the armor, that means. Okay? Let me repeat that again. So that verse says, and having done all, right? At verse 13. That means you've done everything in that armor. Then what do you do? You're done? No, it says to stand. To stand. Let me show you another thing. Verse 11. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, so you can survive satanic attacks if you put on the whole armor, right? But what's before putting on the armor? Look at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Standing, right? And in the power of his might. You have to be strong. You have to take a stand. You know what that means? You have to put effort. You know what that means? You have to break out a sweat. See, you know, uh, people think, well, as long as I put on the whole armor of God, I'll be fine. Did you break a sweat? Did you put in an effort? A lot of people don't want to skip Bible reading. They want to read the Bible as long as it doesn't take much effort. A lot of people want to pray. They don't want to skip prayer. They want to pray for everybody in this room, pray for every need, every trial and pain, as long as there's not much effort. People want to go out soul winning, you know, be with the brethren, win souls to Jesus Christ, as long as they don't have to put much effort. People want to come to church, enjoy fellowship with the brethren, hear good preaching, teaching of the word of God, maybe enjoy a blowout meeting without much effort involved. That's our problem. Then you know what? The devil will devour you. The devil will devour you. Putting on the armor of God is not an effortless deal. Do you understand? It takes effort, sacrifice, working hard, sweat, Sweat, sweat. We live in a day and age where we want to work against. We want to work around the sweat. We don't want to work in the sweat. You know how the devil won't get you? True, putting on the whole armor of God, but that verse says once you've done all, everything in the armor, you've got to stand. In other words, you have to put up an effort. If the devil's been getting to you and you've been doing all these things, 
then it's perhaps because you didn't put up an effort. You didn't stand. That verse says, having done all in the armor, at, then you got to stand. You got to be strong. You got to sweat it out. You got to endure. But no, we're too comfortable Westerners right here. We're, we're very too comfortable in this consumer culture. We have to understand that we need to sweat. We need to break out an effort to survive. You know, I've looked up uh, where serpents eat up their prey. And it ain't pretty. I don't know if you saw it before. It ain't pretty. When a snake eats a prey, whether it be a big python or a small snake, it's very similar. What they do is that they don't uh, tear you with their teeth first, okay? What they do is that they swallow you up. Now, when you're swallowed up inside a snake, man, I can't picture that poor little mouse. But when I was reading some articles, what they do with that poor little mouse or a python that swallows up a, a huge antler or something, then that animal, while he's being swallowed whole, everything is dark inside. And his life didn't end right then and there. He's, uh, he's still surviving. Everything is dark and it's suffocating. It's horrible. You can't breathe. But inside the belly of that snake where there's no hope of getting out, no light of day, and then you can't, uh, you can't see uh, the outside world ever again being sucked inside there. And then what happens is the acid surrounding the inside of that snake just burns you. And that poor little uh, critter or that animal will suffer and writhe, and it will fight. It will try to get out of there. But that snake is fighting too, and he keeps swallowing it up, swallowing it up. And that acid just burns it from the inside. And you know how long it takes? It doesn't take a day. Some snakes, when they fully digest, it takes days. Plural. Plural. That's how slow and painful the process is when that serpent eats up its prey. And while it's, God knows what's going on, struggling, fighting, while the acid is eating it from the inside out, just wants to die any minute, but it can't die. Day one, day two, struggling inside, being tortured, slowly burning from the inside out. And then finally, it dies. Finally, it's consumed after many days later. There are cases of animals who did get out of the serpent's mouth, but then what you see is just bones and muscles and holes all over, and the animal just surviving, but then because it has too many holes in its body, dies. Man, thank God I'm not that creature, right? Man, I, I can't picture, I cannot picture being that animal inside that snake. Wow. My friend, uh, that's what you are inside the belly of that serpent, that Satan. And some of you are inside the belly of that snake. And that snake is sure torturing you, isn't he? You're suffocating. You're choking. You don't think to see the light of day. Some of you are probably wondering, Am I, will I ever be able to see my loved ones again after that? Some of you think are a hopeless case. And then that acid is eating you slowly, ever so slowly. With that sinful struggle you just want victory against, but it's just, you're not. And it's torturing you. It's tormenting you, isn't it? That trial that you're trying to gain victory for the Lord, but you just don't want it. You just want to run away from it. That suffering you're going through is eating you slowly, ever so slowly, isn't it? How many of you are going through depression or bitterness? That is a very slow process that can go for years. And it's killing you. It's killing you. It's torturing your life. My friend, I, wouldn't, I would not want to be in the belly of that snake. Why would you want to be in there? You know how you get out? 
That verse says, be strong. Break out a sweat. Put in an effort. And then put, when you put on that whole armor of God, you can stand against him. If you want to remain weak, then go ahead, be that weak, pray. Be sucked up by that serpent. Just be digested slowly to death by him. But what a fearful way to go. I don't envy your life. I don't want to be in the belly of that snake. Every head bow and every eye shut.